one. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6 and 21. Our song is, I've decided to make Jesus my choice. Jesus Christ the choice. God, we thank you, Father, for who you are, for what you do. God, we thank you for your word on tonight. Lord, we come to glorify you, magnify you, and lift you up. God, we thank you, Father God, for this privilege of just coming before you. We ask you to bless us tonight, Father God. Bless us to hear your word and be blessed by your word. Bless us, Father God, that we will do those things that are pleasing to you. And bless that this night is not in vain. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise. Bless us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. So in the strong, mighty, and powerful, anointed name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. I decide to make Hallelujah to the Lamb. I'm so glad that you've decided to make Jesus your choice and it's fitting with tonight's lesson on tonight. If I can get some readers for tonight, that would really be a good thing for me. I need someone for Matthew 18, 18 through 20. I'm sorry, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, 18 through 20. Brother Miles has that one, I guess. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. Sister Brown has that one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. 2 Chronicles chapter 16, 
verse number nine. Sister Davis, Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse number nine. Uh, Sister Darrington, Acts one and eight. Sister Darrington, Acts one and eight. And then Sister Cora Woods, First Peter three through 15. I'm sorry, First Peter chapter three, verse 16. First Peter chapter three, verse 16. Everybody there? On last night, uh, last Wednesday, we talked about, we talked about, um, no, that's okay, that's okay. We talked about, we talked about um, the five Ps to effective evangelism. And um, if I woke you, if I wake you at three o'clock in the morning, what would you tell me the five Ps of effective evangelism are? Number one. Prepare. Number two. And there was a balk on the mound. <laughs> there was a balk. He started toward home plate and turned and went to second. Let's try it again. Number one. Oh, there was another balk. He went to third base that time. Prepare. Five P's to effective evangelism. Number one. Prepare. Number two. Prepare. Number three. Prepare. Number four. Prepare. And three strides. Let's do that again. Five P's to effective evangelism are prepare, prepare pinpoint, pinpoint, personalize, picturize, and prescribe. And they are written and found in the share in the gospel book that I have before you. And you can give one for a very low price. Amen. Amen. So tonight we will deal with prepare, 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 prepare. This is the most important part of the five P's to effective evangelism. Prepare is the most important part of the five P's to effective evangelism. Brother well, Miles looking for his notes from 1998. <laughs> prepare, prepare, prepare is the most important, the most important of the five P's to effective evangelism. Why we say it's the most important one? Why is prepare the most important one? What do you think? You got to be prepared. You must be prepared. That's a good answer. Anybody else? It's the foundation. It's the foundation. Amen. Why would why would prepare be the most important one? It's the foundation. You got to be prepared. It's where it's your starting point. And many times, how we get started is how we end, right? If we start off with a bad attitude, guess what? That bad attitude will follow you all week long. Mm -hmm. Not just all day, all week. So pre preparation is the most important part of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week we talked about evangelism. Evangelism is sharing the gospel. Evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Evangelism is sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Evangelism is sharing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Who has 1 Corinthians chapter 15? 1 <clears throat> Corinthians chapter 15, someone has that? You stand and read that for us real big, right? 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 through 5. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. You notice I have fingers up as you read, right? What was the first one? Jesus died according to the scripture for our sins. Number two, Jesus was buried. Number three, Jesus rose from the dead. And number four, he was seen. This is what we know as the gospel. The word gospel is good news. And as we know the gospel, we know that these are the four pillars that the gospel stands on. First of all, he died. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose. And the fourth one is evidence of that. 
evidence of Jesus' promise that in three days he will rise again. The disciples want to know, when will the kingdom come? And said, so, well, don't, don't, Jesus said, well, don't worry about that. But if you tear this temple down in three days, I will rebuild it. They thought he was talking about the synagogue. But he was really talking about the temple, Jesus Christ. That's why we are the temple of God. You believe that? We are God's temple. We are God's representative. We are the temple of God. And that's why we all not defile our temple. How do we defile the temple? Is there any way to defile the temple? Mm -hmm. How do we do it? Say again. We defile the temple if you do those things that are against God. Okay, if you do those things that are against God. What are some of the things that we can do that defile our temple? Don't tell me what your problem is. Tell me about somebody else's. <laughs> Getting drunk. Getting drunk. You heard Sister David. She had a lot of pressure, brother, brother Now, <laughs> What does that say? Brother McGill, she eats a lot of pretzels. What does that say? <laughs> she eats a lot, of, a lot of pretzels. Now I don't know what hood she grew up in, but in my hood, those who ate a lot of pretzels, they had a drink with it. Amen. So getting drunk, any, anything else that fires our temple? Misuse of our body. Misuse of our body, including eating. Right. Misuse of our body. Including in you. We defy our temple. So this is the temple of God. Our temple is God's temple. And we ought not defile it. So we're talking about prepare, right? Preparation is important. In the morning time, you prepare for some things. You get up preparing. And most of us grew up in a house that you prepared for Sunday morning when? Saturday. On Saturday night, right? And then as you got older, it didn't matter how long you stayed out and played cards. Right. Sunday morning, you would be prepared to walk out the door when it was time to walk out the door. Right. Amen? Yeah, so preparation is important. Everybody must be prepared to do what God's called them to do. Yeah. You know, some people say, oh, God is calling me to preach. And I say, God is calling you to get your life right. <laughs> Just because you have an incident, just because you have a situation, doesn't mean that God is calling you to preach. God is calling you to get your life in order to build his temple, to build up your temple for him. I mean, brothers was having disasters all over the place and they can hear the Lord speaking to them. Yeah, he's speaking. He's saying, get it right for me. So we must be prepared. We must be prepared. We have to be prepared. Uh, on Wednesday night, I have to be prepared. On Sunday morning, I have to be prepared. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, lays out the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus died. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose. And Jesus was seen. The Bible says he was seen by Cephas, Peter. He was seen by the twelve. Then he was seen by over 500 men at one time. Jesus even prepared to rise again. Even when he died, he was prepared to get up again. So I want you to imagine, imagine with me that every person who has not received Jesus Christ is a patient. You are a soul winner since you're saved. You are born again. Since your soul has been delivered, you are a soul winner. And in every phase of your life, your soul winning experience takes you from one point to the other. Imagine with me tonight that every person who needs to know Jesus, every person who's not born again, just imagine that they are patients. The third thing I want you to imagine is the fact that Jesus Christ, and this is more than imagination, Jesus Christ himself is a great physician. The soul winner is the one who introduced men, women, boys, and girls to Jesus Christ. The person who is not born again is a patient. It is our responsibility as soul winners to get the patient to who? Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ, who is the great physician. I remember my daughter was, was about four years old. She had had surgery, and she had had surgery, and she had, they had put a pad in her, her abdomen area, and all of a sudden that pad started bleeding. It started bleeding, and, and I had to drop all the way from Missouri City down to the medical center. Don't you know that became an emergency? She was losing blood very quickly. And guess what I did? I put my double flashes on. I drove on the left side of the road. I blew my horn at people. They hadn't done anything to me, but I had an emergency on my hand. So the next thing I want you to imagine is that every person who's not saved is your child. Every person who needs to be born again is your child. And I tell you, if your child had an emergency like my child had, guess what you would do? You would put your double flashes on. You would drive on the left side of the road. You would tell people, get over, move out my way. You would speed and you would ignore the speed limit. Because your child is in danger. Every soul winner must look at every born again person as if it's your child. Not somebody else's child. You know, because we'll quit the right people off, aren't we? Oh, that's just another dope dealer that just got killed. Forgetting that it's somebody's child. Every person that you come in contact with that is not saved, I want you to look at that person as your child. And do for that person that you would do for your children. You would create an emergency. You would know that it's an emergency. And you would tell people, get out of my way. And then when you come to the hospital, you wouldn't park in the general parking area. You would park right in front of the emergency room. And security better not come out there and tell you to move. Because you would say, I got an emergency on my hand. Let me tell you, we live in some critical times. We got emergencies on our hands. Turn on the TV, any channel, any network, any station, and they will break into their regular program with breaking news. And there's always somebody, two people, dead today. A couple decided that they would take each other's lives and die together. Somebody killed another child that's walking to the car. Child go to get something out of the car and doesn't return. Bad news is all around us. We need some good news. Need some good news. Jesus Christ offers good news. Amen. And if we're going to win souls, we must be prepared. You remember, don't you? These two brothers walked up on the devil, walked up on the demons, walked up on a man, began to cast them out. Well, they thought they were going to begin to cast them out. The demons begin to speak. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? And whip them to death because they weren't prepared. If we're going to win souls, if we're going to bring people to Jesus Christ, if we're going to evangelize, we must be prepared. First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5 says, Jesus died, Jesus buried, Jesus rose, Jesus was seen, and you must be born again. Who has 2 Chronicles 16 and 9? 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. 2 Chronicles 16 and 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you shall have wars. So we want, we're focusing on the first part, right? The, the A portion of 2 Chronicles 16 and 9 says, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro. This all-seeing God, his eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth trying to find somebody whose hearts are turned toward him. He's trying to look God. Now, this is God. The almighty, all-powerful, supreme God is looking for you. Somebody whose hearts are turned toward him. 
Somebody who has his best interest at heart. Somebody who has soul winning at heart. Because let me tell you a secret. If you major in the minor, you would never get to the major. If you keep focusing on the minor things, you would never get to the major things. If you major in the minor, you will never get to the major. If you keep majoring in stuff that is not major, you will never get to that which is major. If you major in the minor, you will never get to the major. So we must be prepared. The soul winner must be prepared to refer the patient to the great physician, Jesus himself, for healing. The soul winner must be prepared to refer the patient to the great physician. Who must be prepared? The soul winner. The born again person, the person who saved, must be prepared. To refer people to the great physician. The eyes of the Lord are running to and fro looking for somebody who's prepared to refer people to the great physician. Who has Acts 1 and 8? Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power. After that, Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and in, un, in unto the uttermost part of the earth. After the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be witnesses. Mm -hmm. God is concerned about us being witnesses. God wants us to be witnesses. I told you on last week that God has given us the power, the combustion, the explosion. The word power here means dynamite, dunamis. It is the same word we get the word dynamite. It's an explosion. I told you last week that Sister Davis has said it to me, and then my daughter has said it to me, don't be driving my car like that. And all I did is accelerate. When you come off the finish, off the starting line, you ought to accelerate. Don't be driving my car like that. You're going to mess up my car. Don't you know there's an explosion going on in the engine? And every now and then a car needs a good explosion. Let me tell you, there are some churches that need a good explosion every now and then. They need the Holy Ghost. They, they need an, a powerful Ignition that will turn them upside down. And the Bible says, once the Holy Ghost come upon you, you will be witnesses. You will, God is more concerned about us being witnesses than us telling folk off. God is more concerned about us being witnesses unto him by way of Jesus Christ, than he is about us condemning people. God is concerned about us being witnesses. So when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, shall be witnesses mm -hmm. unto me. Mm -hmm. He says, start in a little bitty area. For God does make things so simple. Mm -hmm. He says, start right where you are, in Jerusalem, yeah. with your friends, your family, your neighbors. Start right where you are. Don't go looking for other places to go until you have started right in your little bitty area. Mm -hmm. Then the next place he says, go to Judea, a larger area. Mm -hmm. The culture is different. Things are different from the area you grew up in. People are different. They don't look like you. Go, go, go to Judea. Then he says, Samaria. People that were not raised like you. People that don't think like you. People who don't have things like you have. Go to Samaria. You see, we, we like to talk about, talk about the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. The good Samaritan, he found the man on the side of the road half dead. And when he found him on the side of the road half dead, he bandaged him up. He poured wine into and oil on him. And then he put him on his donkey. 
And the man who, the good Samaritan, he walked while the man rode his donkey. We love talking about that. We love talking about being a good Samaritan. Let me tell you, there are people that are not just half dead. There are people dead on the side of the road. And, and, and then he says, go to the utmost parts of the world. And they are not just physical. They're still walking around. They're not physically dead. They still inhaling and exhaling. They still have breath in their body. They still have their heart pumping blood to every extremity of the body. But if Jesus were to come today, will they go to heaven? They are spiritually dead. And God is looking for us to allow the Holy Spirit to give us the power. Allow the Holy Spirit to lead us, guide us, and direct us. Who has 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15? 1 Peter First Peter chapter 3 verse 15 and it reads but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen. So we are to sanctify the Lord God. We have to make sure that God is in us. We need to be born again. So in other words, we need to know, we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, we are saved, we're born again. We need to make sure that God is set aside from any other thing. He's not the man upstairs mm -hmm. from any other person. He's not the big boss man. Mm -hmm. He is almighty God himself. Mm -hmm. Woo! He's God. And we have to honor him. That's why Jesus says, when you pray, you pray like this. Hallowed be thy name. God, we honor you. God, we praise you. You are a wonderful God. God, we love you. We bless your name, Lord. He's the mighty God. There is no one or no thing like our God. There is nobody like our God. He says, set God aside from anybody else in your heart. Then he says, be ready to give a defense. Be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies in you. Don't be caught off guard. You don't have to give a dissertation. You don't have to do a thesis. You don't have to get into an argument, but be ready. And once you give your defense, once you give your answer, you walk on by. Because the Holy Spirit goes to work at that point. Amen? So the soul winner must be prepared to refer the patient. Who's the patient? The unsaved. The unsaved. Those who are who are not who have met not met Jesus yet. And the unsaved need to be saved. The unsaved need to be healed. The soul winner, in this case, in preparation, the soul winner is an intern. What's an intern? Somebody that's coming in. Somebody that's new. The soul winner is an intern who tells the patient who the doctor is. The soul winner that focuses on who the doctor is. Who's the doctor? His name is Jesus. He tells the soul winner who the doctor is, what the doctor can do, what the doctor will do to him, with him, and through him. Isn't that awesome? The soul winner introduces the patient to the doctor. The soul winner makes sure that the patient sees the doctor. The soul winner is the one who tells the patient who the doctor is, what the doctor can do, what the doctor will do to us, for us, and with us. And not to mention through us. He's the doctor. I had a doctor named Dr. Dwayne Williams in, in, in Sugar Land. And for the last few years, I've kind of, we, we, when your insurance changes, you change doctors. So he had a little, little nurse that would walk in into the room and invite you in. And whenever I had a problem, Whenever I was hurt, one time I walked in, I was hurt here, there, and there. He said, he said, Matt, look like you falling apart. <laughs> but check this out. Whenever his 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 
his nurse was, was Sam. And when little Sam, little short lady, when she walks in, she said, hey, I guess you're here to see the good doctor. She had a smile on her face. She greeted you like she was excited. She said, I know you're here to see the good doctor. And it was before the good doctor came out on TV. She said, you came to see the good doctor. Guess what? Now, I'm going back to Dr. Williams because he's still a good doctor. But every single time I went to the doctor, I didn't look forward to seeing Sam. I didn't look forward to seeing the lady that took my money. I looked forward to seeing the doctor. His name is Jesus. So when I went, to, when I went in and I looked forward to seeing Dr. Dwayne Williams, when I look forward to seeing him, I'm, I'm in all kinds of pain, stuff is hurting me, knees ain't right, feet not right, back out of whack. I'm looking to see the doctor. I see Sam, I'm still hurting. But when the white coat walks in the room, I begin to feel better. Because the doctor is in the house. Sam can tell me what I'm going to do, but the doctor tells me what to do. So when the white coat walks in, a smile comes on my face. Because I know the doctor, the good doctor can fix it. When we introduce people to Jesus Christ, we got to make sure that they understand real well the good doctor is in the house. His name is Jesus. And we got to tell them what, who the doctor is. We got to tell them what the doctor can do and will do to us, for us, with us, and through us. Because he's a good doctor. His name is Jesus. And when there's pain, when there's suffering, when there's agony, when there's defeat, when you're down and out, you need Jesus. Amen. And people who are not saved need Jesus. Do I need Jesus to go to heaven? I just love that little scene. Do I need Jesus to go to heaven? Brother, you need Jesus to pump gas. You need Jesus to go to Walmart. You need Jesus to, to just walk out your house. And you think you don't need Jesus to go to heaven? Yeah, sure do. <laughs> Songwriter says, I need you every minute, every hour, every second of the day. And then another, another songwriter says, I need you right now. I need you right away. I need you now. Since every soul is vital to God, vitally important to God, the winning of the lost soul is considered an emergency. If you're going to win souls, it has to become an emergency to you. We're soul winners. One of the most neglected things in the local church is evangelism. The other one is prayer. One of the most neglected gifts of the body of Christ is evangelism and the other is prayer. We just neglect, I don't know, we don't have time. Have you noticed when we go out to just share Christ or when we go out to walk the streets and prayer, when we go out to bless the neighborhood, very few people show up? It's simply because it's a neglected practice. Why is it so neglected? What's, what's the reason? Why people don't want to evangelize? Matter of fact, they won't even evangelize the people that God opens the door for them with them. Don't you know, sometimes you can be in the middle of a conversation and somebody just says something that opens the door for evangelism and if you're not prepared, you'll shut the door back. I mean, God just throws the door wide open, bam, mm -hmm. and we just freeze. So what's the reason? Fear. fear. Why are we fear? Fearful because we're not prepared. We're fearful because we're not prepared. What's another reason people don't share Christ, don't evangelize? Afraid of rejection. Afraid of rejection. They're considering themselves more than they consider God. Because if, you, if you're so upset over rejection, then guess what? That means you're focusing more on yourself than you're focusing on God. You know how many times people have shut doors in my face? So, okay, thank you. Go to the next one. You're about to say, what, what's the reason why people don't share Christ, don't evangelize? 
Yes, sir. I, th I thought you were about to tell me why. <laughs> they reject it. They, they fear of rejection. They have fear of their, their abilities. That's why we have classes like this so people can be prepared. Because guess what? If you're saved, if you're born again, one of these days, guess what's going to happen? God's going to throw the door wide open. It's going to be your time. The question is, what will you do when it's your time? Some of us think we're the sixth man on a basketball team. Who heard of downtown Freddie Brown? One person. I figure one person. Two people. You remember downtown Freddie Brown? Who did he play for? Seattle. Seattle Supersonics. He was the sixth man. Way before Steph Curry started, before Steph Curry was born, <laughs> downtown Freddie Brown was the sixth man, and when he hit the floor, he was shooting from half court. He hit the floor, they didn't have three points, but he was shooting beyond the three point zone. Because he was prepared, because he was ready. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, always be ready. Always be ready. You may want to write this down. The greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. The greatest miracle that one will ever experience is the saving of a lost soul. What's the greatest miracle? The saving of a lost soul. What's the greatest miracle you will ever experience? The saving of a lost soul. What's the greatest miracle that one will ever experience? The saving of a lost soul. A lost soul. It's the greatest miracle that one will ever experience. It is the saving of a lost soul. The soul winner must already have salvation. The soul winner must already be saved. How do you get somebody to save and you're not saved? How can you introduce somebody to somebody that you haven't met before? One year, a, a church came here and, you know, they decided that they were going to. A lady comes to me and she says, well, well, this person from our hometown is going to introduce the pastor. What do you think I said, Sister Brown? <laughs> now, this church came and the people in the audience didn't know the person that was going to introduce the pastor. So, if you're going to introduce two people, then you ought to know both persons. Am I right? So I said, no, I'm going to introduce the pastor. Because I know the people and I know the pastor. And if, if, if someone else introduces the pastor, it's because he has been here or she has been here before and the people know that person and that person knows the pastor. It just makes sense to me, right? So if you want to introduce somebody to Jesus, you need to know him for yourself. You need to know who Jesus is. <laughs> What does it look like you not knowing who Jesus is and you introducing somebody to Jesus? So the soul winner must be saved, must have already experienced salvation for his or herself in order to be effective in soul winning. If you're going to be an effective soul winner, you got to know Jesus for yourself in order to be effective. You must know Jesus. Jesus talks about this with, with Nicodemus. John chapter 3, verse number 3. In John chapter 3, verse number 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus walks up and says, I know, I know you of God because you can do all these miracles. No man can do all these miracles that you do unless he comes from God. Jesus says to Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he or she cannot see the kingdom of God. 
This process of seeing the kingdom, this, this process of knowing who God is, this process can only come through spiritual eyes. Can only be seen. You can only see Jesus through spiritual eyes. So you must be born again. You got to be born again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 delivers to us the fact that the natural man cannot perceive or receive the things of God. The natural man can't even imagine the things of God. So we must be born again. We must be prepared. We must be saved. We must be born again. Brother Miles, I think you got Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, and saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of the, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. 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 Jesus speaks to his disciples. He says, what you need to know is that all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And I'm sending you to go. I'm sending you to witness. I'm sending you to baptize. I'm, tell, I'm sending you to tell people about the great, through the great commission, who Jesus is. And he says to us, therefore the soul winner must be born of the Spirit of God in order to carry out the Great Commission. Jesus says, I'm sending you out that you can be a good example and lead people to Christ and lo, I will be with you always. Even to the end of the world, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the era, I will be with you. Key word there is low. This word low means indeed I'll be with you. Surely I'll be with you. It's not the way daddy defined low. Daddy didn't want to fly on an airplane. So every time they talked about flying, or every time they talked about a helicopter, and every time daddy saw mama get in the cop crop nuts with one of his friends, and they would tell him, you next, he would say, no, no, no. God said, low, he will be with you. Not high, he will be with you. So the key word here, low, certainly I will be with you. I guarantee you I'll be with you. So we ought to go. Go, be there for. This word go means in the process of you doing your daily task. In the process of going, go and share things about Jesus. I just said that we need to be born again. We need to be saved in order to be effective in evangelism. The first assignment uh, for this series is for you to write down your salvation story. Write down your salvation story. Just a half a page or a page or so. Write down your salvation story. Don't tell me how God rescued you from a spinning car and he stopped you right before you went through, went into the ditch. Don't tell me that. I'm talking about the one time that you were born again, the one time you were saved, the one time you gave your life to Christ. One time. Talk to me about who was there, what the conversation was about. You may not remember the date. You may remember the date. Most of you can tell me my salvation story just as well as I can. How, how, do you, how, did, how did that happen? How do you know my salvation story more than that? Because I'm able to interpret it, I'm able to regurgitate it, I'm able to give it to you. That's what I want you to do. Just tell me your salvation story. Don't give me no flowery story, okay? Just the salvation story. Any questions? Comments? Who think I'm already great? Well, y'all thought that anyway. So. <laughs> That's nothing new. God bless you real good. So you're going to write down your salvation. Those of us who are, those of you who are listening online, write down your salvation story and support it with scripture. What's, what scripture says about you being saved? Because if you, you say that you are saved and you have not received Jesus Christ, you're not saved. 
If you say that you're born again and you have not received Jesus Christ, you're not saved. If you say that you've been born again by any means other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are not saved. One lady told me in a teaching session, I dare you say that. I know I'm saved. Well, tell me how. Be a little red mark on paper. Tell me more. Because it's salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ. So you're going to write your salvation story. And you're going to bring it back and share it with us. So we can celebrate with you. Jesus Christ must always be the main attraction. Jesus Christ must always be the main attraction in any witnessing encounter. Who's the main attraction? Jesus. You got a good story. I admire your story. I celebrate with you because of your story. But it's his story that changed lives. It's his story that changed hearts. Jesus Christ must be the main attraction in any witnessing encounter. Jesus Christ must be. After all, he's the great physician. He's the one that makes the wounded well. He is the bomb in Gilead. He's the one that solved our problems. Jesus Christ is the main attraction. So what does that say? When you're witnessing, people ought to hear about Jesus. When you're sharing your faith, they ought to hear that your faith lined up with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. A witness should never focus on his or her thing or anybody else's thing other than Jesus Christ. A soul winner should focus on Jesus Christ, him crucified and resurrected. You must witness by way of the Holy Spirit. You must be led by the Holy Spirit. You must be guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us into. Now, even though we're trained, even though we're prepared, we don't just walk up and start talking. We want the Spirit to lead us. Last week I told you about how I would go to Sharpstown Mall, stand on the second floor, and as I stood on the second floor, I would ask God, God, send somebody my way for me to share Christ with me. I felt like I was prepared. I felt like I was equipped. And every single time I prayed, God, send somebody my way, God sent somebody my way. And I was able to share Christ with them. So you want to be adamant about obeying the Holy Spirit. It is imperative that we seek God through his word. It is important, it is imperative that we seek God through God's word. It is imperative, it is important, it is crucial that we seek God through God's word. That's why we're studying God's word, we're reading God's word, we are listening to God's word, we are hearing the voice of God. It is important that you hear the word of God through God's word and pray over his word daily. I've said before, you pray over his word and you pray his word. Two different things. You pray over God's word and you pray God's word. Every parent likes to hear their child regurgitate what they told them. Now, it may, it may wait, they may wait till they get grown, but you're still proud to hear what they got to say, something that you told them. The tragedy is sometimes people wait till their parents are dying to say, I remember when you told me this and I thank you for it. Every parent wants to hear his or her child say some things that they've already told you. So that's what God wants. God wants you to pray his word. God, you said in your word that you will be with me. You said in your word that if I will go, the Holy Spirit will do the drawing. You said in your word, God, that you will be with me, Lord, even until the ends of the age. You want to pray God's word. Then we want to pray over God's word. 
I, I get ready to crack my Bible. I get ready to read. I get ready to study. Regardless of where I'm studying, where I'm reading, I'm going to say, now, Lord, I'm about to study your word. I want you to make it clear to me. I want you to make it plain to me. God bless me to understand your word. And Lord, when I've heard your word and I've read your word, Lord, I want you to speak to me day, deep down in my heart through your word. So now I'm praying over your word. Then when I get through praying, I shut my Bible, I want to meditate on his word. And when I meditate on it, I'm still praying, Lord, bless your word. That's why the psalmist say, let your word reside in my heart that I will not sin against you. Give me your word. The word keeps us from sinning. The word keeps us from being so uptight over everything. The word guides our footsteps. The word is a lamp unto our feet. And the word is a, is a, is a, is a, is a light to our pathway. It's the word. So we have to concern ourselves with the word. Let me, let me make this last few points and I'll, I'll let you out of here. As a soul winner, you should spend 90% of your time in Bible study, prayer, and meditation. In other words, in preparation. You should spend 90% of your soul winning time. Let me make that clear. 90% of your soul winning time in Bible study, prayer, and meditation. Only 10% of your soul winning time should be geared towards sharing the gospel. What did I just say? When you are winning souls, 90% of your time ought to be spent in Bible study, prayer, and meditating on God's word. The other 10% of your soul winning time ought to be actually sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Why is that? Somebody tell me. Help me. We, we talk about being prepared. You must be prepared. You have to be prepared. You got to be prepared. And if you, if you spend all your time talking to people about Jesus or trying to share about Jesus, guess what? You are not prepared. We must spend 90% of our time in Bible study, prayer, and meditation. 90% of our soul winning time being prepared. And 10% of our time ever, even just sharing the good news of Christ. And guess what that does? Number one, it changes us on the inside. The word changes us. The word rearranges us. The word makes us different. The word prepares us. And as we are prepared, then that other 10% of our soul winning experience comes through telling people about the good news of Jesus. 90 plus 10 is how much? So how much time you got to gossip? How much time you got to deal with something else? How many times you got to put something else on your plate? So everything we do, especially from the church, ought to have an evangelistic thrust. Our music ought to be evangelistic. Our preaching ought to be evangelistic. Our, our broadcast ought to be evangelistic. We ought to reach people for Christ. Back home, they teach the young preachers that if you don't include the gospel, you just said a good speech, just don't sit down. <laughs> See, y'all so kind here. Y'all so, so nice here. Back home, before the brother even get up to speak, they tell him, now if you don't include the gospel, I'm going to get up and walk out of here. If you don't preach the death, burial, and resurrection, you just gave a good speech and made people happy. So in order to teach it, in order to preach it, you need to know it. So 90% of your time must be spent in preparation. Bible study, mm -hmm. prayer time, and meditating on God's word. Amen. There may be somebody that don't know Jesus. This is your opportunity to get to know him. We talk much about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it all leads to this moment that you can be born again. Mm -hmm. You can be saved. 
you can go to heaven. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can get to know Jesus right now. Right where you are, you can get to know him. You can get to know Jesus in such a way that you can be born again. Just believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for you and he died for me on a hill called Calvary. He gave his life for you. And if it had not been anybody else in the world but you, Jesus would have died. And since he died for you, he wanted to make sure that you understood well that he is able to secure your future. So he was buried and he rose from the dead. And the evidence of his resurrection was seen by other people. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved by this gospel. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, this is your moment. Just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've honestly received Jesus as your personal Savior, we believe that you are born again and you are going to heaven and we praise God for it. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the main attraction. If you want to get to know him even better, just come and be a part of our church in Southeast Houston. And if you're local, please visit us. If you're global, please visit us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Let us know if you want to be a part of our church. Just let us know. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gift. It is time to give to the Lord. We thank God for this privilege of giving unto the Lord. God has blessed us and, and He's keeping us. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting. Dot Jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 that's Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. We appreciate you joining us here at the New Beginning Church. Please tune in on Sunday at 9 o'clock for our Sunday school. And tune in on Sunday at 1030 for our regular service. And we'll be glad to have you a part of our service. And thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for being a part. Come back at 715 as we continue this study of sharing the gospel along with the five P's to effective evangelism. Let us stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we thank you for the opportunity of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, for blessing our lives and keeping us, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for saving our souls and allowing us to witness for you. And tell men, women, boys, and girls about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us say together. Amen. 
We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are dismissed.